Is that really the fastest you can play? Are we really gonna talk about Whiplash again? So you do know the difference! Okay, I promise we're using Terrence Fletcher to talk about something super interesting. Not just critiquing this mediocre movie to death, because that's been done. Jazz culture, as it appears in the movie Whiplash, is off a little bit. Well, it just was so absurd that rests on a number of erroneous premises. But what nobody's really done is talk about exactly what makes a bad drum teacher and a good one. Like, how exactly do we teach better? And to do that, I'm gonna be telling a lot of real life stories and enlisting the aid of one of my favorite movies, which you may not have heard of. Your whole life you've known that a foot can only kick. You've known that a foot cannot punch. Forget everything that you know. Stay tuned. So in this lesson, I'm gonna give you six examples of bad drum teaching, whether they're Terrence Fletcher, real life examples I've seen, or both, and contrast them with what good drum teachers do. Is a teacher you're working with committing one of these six sins? Are you committing any of these with your students? Let's dive in. Number six, bad. Getting frustrated when people aren't absorbing what you're telling. Anybody who's done any kind of formal music education has probably dealt with a teacher who got frustrated when you didn't immediately absorb what he or she was telling you. Is that really the fastest you can play? I don't think I need to spend a lot of time illustrating what this looks like. A lot of us have a pretty vivid picture of it. Start counting. Five, six, seven. In four, damn it! Look at me! What it looks like in real life. I never had somebody slap me in a rehearsal. What I did experience was practicing something super hard week after week, then having a teacher tell me very calmly and politely that it was still bad and he didn't understand why. Which made me feel terrible, but did in some way motivate me to work harder. The trouble was, instead of looking forward to the next lesson, I started to dread it. It wasn't until years later when I realized I was doing the same thing to my students, because the director of the storefront music school where I was teaching in New Jersey pulled me aside and encouraged me to read some books on teaching and learning psychology. So, how do we do it better? I have to begin with a mea culpa. I never did read those books, although I read some others. But over the years, I've learned kind of a rule of thumb. Before I get frustrated, have I tried everything? Take a student who's having trouble playing in time. Have I recommended playing with a metronome? If that fails, have I demonstrated playing with a metronome in the lesson so he can see the difference between good and bad? Maybe, as is likely, the student can't hear himself exactly as he sounds. That's practically the textbook definition of a beginner. Have I tried recommending he record himself? Failing that, have I tried recording ourselves in the lesson, then listening back? You could picture this turning into a fun game rather than a death march. Say, like the drummers in Whiplash, he's struggling to play something fast. Have I addressed the mechanical reasons that might be? Does he have tension? Is he playing with arms or wrists instead of fingers? Or maybe we're doing everything right and he just needs more time. I think you get the point. Bad teacher outsources 100% of the responsibility for why a student's not grasping something to the student and uses negative reinforcement to motivate that student to sink or swim. Good teacher is absolutely relentless in finding a way to engage the student to deconstruct the problem together. Sidebar, the one exception to this is somebody who doesn't want to learn. Maybe he's there because his parents make him, but he's not motivated to practice. He's standing at the pad week after week and he's forgotten everything you've told him. Even in these situations, we should take the challenge on ourselves as teachers. Can we be the teacher that kindles some excitement in this kid who thought he was just killing 45 minutes while his mom was across the street at the nail salon? Even if he or she doesn't practice, could we make this 45 minutes an oasis and maybe just practice together with coaching feedback? Feeling that, could I at least recognize the opportunity to make a human connection and maybe be a little conspiratorial? Hey, you're stuck with me for 45 minutes and my boss needs to think I'm doing something. If you let me spend 15 minutes showing you something, we can spend the rest of the time listening to Spotify. Okay, number one got super long. Let's get on to number two. Number five, bad. Telling people they're not as good as they think. Every so often, I'll get comments on YouTube or Instagram from drummers sharing their clips with me. Every few months, there's one who's extremely arrogant and is also clearly deluded about his or her ability. It's tempting to cut them down to size a little, right? There's something about the Dunning-Kruger effect that just grinds the gears. And I've had a few teachers over the years who had that same instinct. You may be good for- Name of hometown. But when you get to college, you'll see. Fucking dog, bro. I don't know how you even got into this school. You're arrogant. 
You don't realize you're just a baby. That last one was actually a martial arts teacher. And a friend. It's complicated. So as teachers, we're gonna put these people in their place, right? We're gonna tell them, then they're gonna realize. Except, when has that ever worked in real life? When was the last time you got into a heated argument in a Facebook comment thread, and the other person eventually said, you know what, you made me realize I was wrong. Why don't therapists just say, let me save you some time and money. Your parents' divorce filled you with fear of emotional dependence, so you've been cultivating a holier-than-thou attitude and resisting real emotional connection for years. Whoa well, now, that's hitting a little close to home. Why don't drug addicts just quit and go to rehab because somebody yells at them? I think you're picking up what I'm laying down. You can't make somebody realize he's wrong. We have to realize it on our own. And bad teachers are just going to cause us to dig in our heels. Because we're going to stay here until I find a drummer who can fucking play in time. So, how do we do it better? We have to show people, and they have to come to their own realization. When I was in college, I took a bata lesson with a teacher named Mike Spiro. My friends and I played the drums for him and did what we thought was a pretty killer rendition. Spyro was super complimentary, telling us it was rare to see Americans who put that much effort into learning Bata. Then he told us to take off the drums and we went upstairs where he played us a grainy video of Afrokuba de Matanzas playing exactly the same thing. It was equivalent to a high school jazz drummer who's only ever heard other high schoolers suddenly learning about the existence of Tony Williams. Or Luke learning about the force for the first time. What is it? It's your father's lightsaber. I've had that moment of, oh, this is how high the levels go, a few other times. When my friend Obed took me to see Eric Harlan for the first time at the 55 bar. The first time I saw Marcus Gilmore live. Etc. So what can we as teachers do to put somebody in their place? We can expose them to great players and ask their opinion about what makes these folks better. That's basically what I've been trying to do on this channel for the last year and a half. Okay, let's go back to Terrence Fletcher. So you do know the difference! Number four. Bad. Assuming you know somebody's motivations. So you do know the difference. As I just mentioned, sometimes we've got a student with a big head. But how sure are we that we really know their motivations? Remember the martial arts teacher who told me I was arrogant? Just like Fletcher and Whiplash, he was assuming he knew what I was thinking. I can assure you, it wasn't, I don't need to learn this, I'm too good. It was probably more like, there's a lot coming at me and I need to find a way to try just a few of these things to see what works. Here are just a few things I've seen that can look like arrogance unless you dig deeper. Somebody celebrating a small victory in what's otherwise been an arduous journey. Somebody confident in other areas of his life and carrying that swagger into a drum context. And having the perspective that he's still awesome even if he's not great at the drums. Somebody genuinely confused but afraid to ask a question so she's putting up a false front. In the Whiplash example, I think Andrew Neiman was trying to swim and was misled by Fletcher's behavior earlier in the rehearsal. See next item, I'm not creating a consistent context, but I don't think he was deliberately rushing or dragging. So, how do we do it better? As teachers, it starts with assuming positive intent. Remember our rule of thumb. Before I get frustrated, have I tried everything? Next, and this is surprisingly effective, just ask. Hey, it seems like you're processing this. Can I ask what's going on in your head? If my martial arts teacher had asked me that, I would have given him feedback. When I try to do it like it looks like you're doing it, it's not working for me. I'm trying to figure out what the crucial bit that I'm missing is. If a drum student isn't grasping an exercise and I ask that question, it'll give me way more data about how what I'm teaching is landing with him or her. Then I can repeat lesson one, try multiple things to get the point across. Oh, another quick aside, because I know those of you who are band directors are going to say, look, when I've got 60 kids in a room, I can't always afford to ask each individual one what they're thinking. Of course I understand. But I still think the assumed positive intent thing looms large. Don't chew anybody out in front of the room, and later on circle back one-on-one -on -one to find out what the issue was. Apropos of which, let's talk about that studio band rehearsal. Got Buddy Rich here. Of course, this is exaggerated for drama, but I've definitely been in situations like this. Number three, bad, not setting expectations. I'm not saying this is great, but if Andrew Neiman had realized the potential of being singled out, yelled at, and slapped, he probably would have shown a little more deference in rehearsal and not been taken so off guard. Best case scenario, he would have avoided enrolling in that school in the first place and saved his money.
I've been in situations like this a lot. Most famous was a certain group in grad school where the teacher was smiling and cracking wise until somebody messed up. Then it was fire and brimstone. But there were also martial arts academies where unwritten rules about deference were shrouded in locker room hijinks and shit talk. One of the most underrated movies of the last year, The Art of Self-Defense, even satirized these context landmines that can be so arduous for a newcomer learning the ropes. White is before color. You haven't earned color yet. But let's get concrete. How do we do it better? This applies to managing people who work for you as well as teaching. Do not set a context of buddy-buddy you're later going to betray. I see a little of myself in you. Either keep things formal from the jump, then if you need to be stern, it's not a whiplash-inducing surprise, or if you're gonna be a little more buddy-buddy like I am, in for a penny, in for a pound. You now owe this student a friend in most contexts, and an explanation if things deviate much from there. Now for number two. Number two, bad. Not remembering what's realistic for somebody's level. Is that really the fastest you can play? Real life versions of this for me were twofold. I've had percussion teachers who said, I don't understand why you can't play this. Everyone else in your class can. And I've had martial arts teachers who said, you suck. You're not doing X, Y, Z thing that brown belts can do. This is similar to getting frustrated but not trying other ways to communicate, but it's a specific flavor of it. Say Neiman had started out not being able to play fast at all. Then through lots of working till his hands bled, he improved like 15%. But then say in his next lesson, because he still wasn't perfect, he got the same treatment. Because we're gonna stay here until I find a drummer who can fucking play in time. How we do it better. As I discussed at length in my whistling video, learning happens incrementally. And it's not always linear. Sometimes it can be like the flat part of a hockey stick graph. Then all of a sudden, shoot up. Then maybe even dip a little. None of which means your student isn't practicing or doesn't care. I'm not saying humans are dogs or rats, but the science of operant conditioning and positive reinforcement is pretty clear on this. Reward approximately correct efforts. Say, hey Andrew, your up-tempo swing has gotten a lot better in the last week. In a few months, you'll really be nailing it. If he hasn't improved much, but you can tell he's working hard, say, hey Andrew, it looks like you've been practicing a lot. Don't worry, sometimes breakthroughs take time, but you'll get there. But what about those times when we're not actually helping as teachers, but rather hurting? Number one, bad. Giving bad instructions or cues, or too much detail without a hierarchy. I'm hoping you'll forgive my using a clip from the art of self-defense here instead of whiplash, because this is a subtle one. Today's lesson, to kick with your fists and punch with your feet. That makes perfect sense. Excuse me? Riley Stearns, who wrote the film, is a purple belt in BJJ with seven years of experience. So nothing's accidental. If I had to guess, I'd say he's satirizing some of the completely ambiguous instruction teachers sometimes give. When that's gone wrong for me in martial arts, it's been stuff like this. Pass to the left side, but make sure you get your elbow in side. If he gives you the knee shield, pummel the right hand underneath his outside leg and make sure you shelf the knee on your shoulder, not your elbow joint. Then pummel your left foot into his knee joint. Now tripod and circle to the side of the shelved leg. Whatever you do, don't lose the far side underhook. And especially if I'm a beginner, I'm thinking, you've just given me a hundred discrete things to memorize. So when I practice the movement, I'm thinking about those hundred steps. And I've got no idea which ones are make or break. Contrast that with John Donaher, one of the best teachers. There are six fundamental requirements that my opponent must satisfy if he's gonna pass my guard. Consistently, Donaher operates from a hierarchy. If I get everything else wrong about this move, what are the one to two things I have to get right? Our job is to fight our opponent along all six of these requirements. That allows the student to focus on just those one to two things at first. Then he can refine. How do we do it better? To take this back to the drums, there are a thousand and one ways we could overcomplicate and overwhelm a student. Just think of playing a swing beat on the ride cymbal. You can layer up at least four different things to think about, one for each limb. More if you talk about dynamics, playing in the center of the drum, etc. Here's a technique I like to use. If somebody's having any trouble at all keeping it straight, I like to take things away, until we simplify down to something he or she can play easily. Often I'll use cues like, okay, continue to play this, but shift your attention to your left foot. Try to get a louder chick sound from the hi-hat. Good, let's repeat this for a few minutes. Okay, continue to play, but now let's focus on your bass drum foot. Try to make it a little softer, etc. Bottom line, there's a lot of territory between most of us and Terrence Fletcher or Sensei from Art of Self-Defense, but there are doubtless things we could all do better. When teaching's working, I want a student to feel like I'm an ally, who, if he's committed, will push him, but not too far, who, if he's bored, will try to inspire him, 
who, if he's getting stuck, will try to help him figure out why, and who will always blame myself before I blame him. Anyway guys, hope you've enjoyed this lesson, and if you've been following the channel for a hot minute and feel like maybe you're ready to go a little deeper, maybe you're ready to study drums with me-ish, I recommend my products, the coaching course and the practice course, which we only open up a few times a year and we only open up to subscribers on my mailing list. To get on the insiders list, to get in the know, all you have to do is take the simple step of clicking on the link below the player, entering in your email address on the next page, in exchange for which I will send you three completely free videos that I don't share on YouTube, which are a little more formalized instruction with transcriptions and everything. They're like three mini courses which I assert will make you better in the next three weeks than you've gotten in the last six months. Dudes, it's been real. Always enjoy these. See you again in another lesson of the week. So I think we're good. Drum demos. Drum demos. I don't drum demos. If people only knew how silly I was off camera. You want the true measure of a man, ask his video editor. Hey man, we said we were looking for a drama, not a drama. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <sighs> Window speed. Hey, we're gonna knock this out. We're gonna knock this out. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> to all my Canadian friends, I accept your apology. <laughs> I legitimately look like a Serbian gangster. <laughs> Did you see this? I cut my own hair, guys. It's still shitty. <laughs>